Welcome back, everyone. You are listening to Joygasm, a video game and movie podcast. I'm Russ, Xbox Live Toaster 360. He is Steve, Xbox Live Stevevich. And may the fourth be with us all. May the fourth. In episode 223 today, May 7th, 2021. <laughs> We're going to be catching up with each other before going into our topic of the day, which is the initial impressions of Star Wars The Bad Batch from Disney+, Plus, which you can fast forward to if you look at the timestamps located in the detailed section of YouTube or your favorite podcast provider section below. Steve. Yeah, Russ? Happy Friday. Happy Friday to you. Oh, much obliged? I know. Much obliged. Yes, it is. What have you been up to? Well, Russ, nothing much. Nothing much. I uh, got a lot of work to do. <sighs> you know, it's busy on this side of the table. Uh, someone's got to make the money to feed the um, future children <laughs> at some point. <laughs> uh, <laughs> say, feeding who? <laughs> that Chihuahua eats a lot. You're wheeling oh, and a man. dealing. That's what you're doing. It's making it rain. Mm-hmm. Um, did I tell you though that I, I finished the Sopranos? Did I tell you that, Russ? You did. Yes. Did I tell you I, was, I, I told you that I was about to finish it? That, that, but did I tell you I finished? I thought oh, I know I told you I was on the final season. No, you told me you finished it. I, if I remember correctly, in fact, you said that you had finished it for the fourth time. Am I accurate in that statement? Fifth. Time, Russ. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to join the party. Russ, we want to watch more, though. We want more Sopranos. That might be a little tall order, Steve, considering the, the current state of the cast. Yeah, James Galfini has bit the big one. It's unfortunate. Years ago. But um, did I tell you that the show was nominated for like uh, over 100 Emmys? I'm not surprised. I remember when it was coming out, uh-huh. everybody could not stop talking about it. It was critically acclaimed. Yeah, some shows get a Emmy. Some shows get five. This one was at least nominated for, I think it was like 111. But that was over the course of the, its entire of run. Of the entire it run. It wasn't like there was like one no, season where we're like, was, we're just making up categories just to give you more. It was over the entire run. That's right. But I think it won like 89. 89 Emmys. No slouch. That's no, good. it was holding its shoulders straight. But what have you been at watching and playing this week, Steve? Russ. Well, I guess the highlight of the week was me. No. But we, uh, I bought a game on PC. You did. Congratulations. It has been a minute and a half. But I bought Overwatch, as you, as you right. already know. You didn't say it right. Overwatch. Thank you. And um, after a uh, buddy of mine had been pestering me on the daily to get it we finally got it and it was nice to kind of switch things up a little bit sure. you know we were playing yeah. on xbox forever and it was just you and i chatting you know mono e mono connected and um it was nice to switch it up because we got to play with some other folks yeah. who were pretty darn skilled absolutely and we got to talk four way on the on the the, the chatter boxy mm-hmm and uh, I got to, to strategize and, and make a game plan. And yeah, we didn't win every game, but it was uh, it was really fun. Um, well, the competition was more intense, too, just it because was intense. your friend is way higher up on yeah. the, the level charts. Right. So we were we, we, we got into the thick of it more often than not. But hey, held our own. It's, it's, it's exciting. You know? Yeah. No, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed playing with them. We'll have to do it again. Yeah, we have to do it again. No. Uh, and I'm impressed that my <laughs> lowly PC that can pretty much do multitasking. I can open up many windows of Microsoft Word. Well, that's good. And the internet. And I mean, I it handles it wonderfully. Mm-hmm. But a game, I mean, I mean, Legend of Tariff plays fine. Sort of. I mean, for the most part. But it, it runs at a silky smooth 15 frames per second. I don't get epilepsy, you know? 
I can handle it. Mm. I can handle it. So you, you've better, actually played it, Legends of Runeterra on your PC? Yeah. Oh, oh, I did not know this. I thought you were only playing it on mobile. I said, I, oh, no, no. I tried to get it on mobile and I forgot that my little, my little, um, they give you like a number, like you have to find yourself. Right. Like you can't just like, and I forgot the, my, my password. I think actually, I think I've written down somewhere, but I couldn't get it on mobile because of that one reason. Like, yeah, I gave us your password or make a new your account. Password. I'm like, I don't want to make another account. I want to use my account. daddy. Oh yeah. <laughs> Dual say poppy 77. Oh uh, <laughs> yeah. Up high. Oh yeah. So anyhow, make love and would approve. Right. So, um, no, I haven't gotten on mobile that for that one reason. So I've always been playing on, on PC. Mm. Russ. So, um, and that, that, I mean, that, so that's absolutely fine. Yeah. It does slow down. Like when, when some of the graphics go like boof in your face and, and it just kind of, kind of slows it a little bit. Yeah. So, I was curious of what settings you had on for, I didn't Overwatch. even change. I, I, um, I didn't even change anything. I, I, it, it probably like auto detected what you were able to run yeah. at a stable yeah. 480i. <laughs> <laughs> That's a number I've not heard in a long time. So it says it runs on Windows 7, and I thought, yeah, well, I got Windows 10. So, I mean, I'm good. And um, I have a whole lot of memory. I have a whole lot of space. I mean, I just don't use it. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it, it loaded up, and then I got worried during the tutorial where I was Solar 76, and it made me go through the tutorial. Sure. I was like, okay, shoot that, shoot that. And I was like, okay, Okay, next one. <laughs> <laughs> and it like froze. I'm like, what do I do now? I'm just holding the gun up to the sky. And it would do that throughout the whole entire tutorial. And I, I, I told my buddy, I was like, I don't know if this is going to work. Like, I, I mean, it loads the game. It's something to miss. It provides a whole new challenge, you see, when your computer decides to freeze up temporarily and then resume. You know, it, 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 it's exciting. Well, it's like the thing with the Xbox and, you know, PlayStation, is that they don't have all these other tasks running in the background, which, which you have to, like, turn off, but you don't know if you should turn them off because then it may, like, disable something in the sure. in your computer and, like, 500 hackers are going to, like, steal all your information. So, like, what do I do? Or, like, uh, you know, so I, I ended up, anyway, I ended up restarting the thing and it worked absolutely fine, but, like, all the, the lines are, like, staircasing, aliasing each other. <laughs> like, whatever. It, I, yeah, it. the consoles are plug and play. They're specifically designed with, right. depending on if you are Xbox or PlayStation, hmm. the Xbox has what are called TCRs, which uh, stand yeah. for Technical Certification Requirements. Uh, if you're Sony, however, at least in the past, they referred to them as TRCs, mm. or Technical Requirement Certifications. Right. Not as you can see, yeah. they did the old Jeez. switcheroo to remain original. But yeah, that's the, all the companies have to adhere to their sets of standards and requirements. And that way you have games that will run either, well, ideally consistently at 30 frames or 60 frames per second. I'm probably not going to remember that after tonight. That's okay. I'll tell you again. That's why I'm here. I'm here to help you out, Steve. Whew. So anyhow, that was amazing. Good. And uh, we did get a little bit of a late start, uh -huh. but we had a late finish also. Good. Get a little bonus at the end. It was a lot of fun. It was. And it was nice being, I actually got a ton of Moira experience. Normally I don't mm -hmm. play as Moira, but mm -hmm. I did that night and uh, I began to really understand her strengths. Yeah. I got to switch all the buttons around with Moira. The one thing, because so what Moira does when she throws out the, the, those little, you know, okay, I'm going to hurt you with this hand and I'm going to heal you with this hand. So I think I got my two like balls. Right yeah. Here in my yeah, hands. yeah. Orbs. Orbs. Power orbs. And so... It switched the buttons, and so um, yeah. I'm used to right trigger being like like your main like shoot like hurt, and then left trigger being heal, and then when you bring out the orbs, it goes right trigger but on the left side to shoot out, and then you know uh, left trigger on the right side to shoot. I'm like, oh, I don't know what's going on, and so I have to have to go switch all the buttons around. I had the same problem. I had the same thing where, well, first of all, Wednesday night was just foobar because. Yeah. Oh, I had to update my PC version of Overwatch, which I hadn't done in a long time. That was my that was my fault. That was your bad. I'm sorry. However, once we actually got up and running, it was the same kind of deal where all of a sudden I realized that I had set all of the different controller mapping and everything else for the Xbox, not for the PC. So certain things I was trying to do, I'm like, why is 
oh, and I just kind of rolled with it and remembered how you do it the default I, way. I didn't. So were you using a mouse and like keyboard? I was not. I was using my Xbox controller. Atta boy. Mm. Yeah, there was no way I'm going to like grab a mouse. And you're like, okay. Uh, space bar, space bar, X, 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 Y, Y, Y. Well, <laughs> like, I, I mean, I'm not, oh, no, I'm not adverse to using the, the PC way of, of gaming, but the problem is that I've never played <laughs> Overwatch itself using the PC button. So I have no idea like what, where all the different things are. And because we were playing with your friends, I was like, okay, well, I need to be somewhat competent here. So yeah. Well, with the Xbox controller. Anything else, Steve? Mm, nope, Russ. That's about it. We did, uh, where we'll get into the... Our topic of the day, yeah. which uh, we watched uh, a little bit of the Bad Batch as opposed to the uh, Good Batch. Indeed. Chocolate chip cookies. Steve, I'm here to show you uh, something that I have been reading as of late. Ah. I was looking forward to this. And uh, hopefully I can balance it out here, but oh, we'll see, we'll see if it'll like stay. A little, it's a Will it stay there, here. huh? Yeah. So... Um, the studio that I work at mm. started up a bit of a book club. Oh, really? And so the first book that we are reading is Creativity.Inc. Mm. I had no idea that this book existed. Apparently, uh -huh. this book came out in 2014, which blew my mind because I figured I was kind of on top of this type of stuff. Yeah. Especially when it, when it applies to Pixar and that sort of thing. Sure. No idea that this existed. So I was really grateful that this was the first book that we decided we we're going to try out and have a read through. Now, I haven't finished the book yet. I am about, I'd say, halfway through, maybe 60% way yeah. through. No. Um, <laughs> however, the book is amazing for someone like myself because oh, yeah. um, it's got words in it. It's got words and it's got pictures too, by the way. Nice, nice. pictures. But one of the things that's really cool about it, first of all, it's written by Ad Catmull, who is the president of both Pixar Animation Studios as well as Disney Animation Studios now. Mm -hmm. But he got his start back in the John Lasseter and Steve Jobs days. And this book chronicles how he got his start in college and then goes into talking about his journey through computer graphics. Mm. This guy has contributed a metric ton oh, yeah? to my industry. Oh. Which I had, I, I didn't realize like how much he did, but like this man it was one of the pioneers of what is called sub uh, sub D's, which is uh, a term used in 3D modeling where you do subdivisional surfacing, and that completely changed the game. In fact, if I remember correctly, the first animated short film to use sub D's was Jerry's game, where he's playing chess by himself. Sure. And everybody was blown away by how that looked at the time. And it was because this brand new technique was actually used. Well, this book talks about how the whole thing got started. There are things in here, Steve, that like connects the dots for me because I, I mean, I keep tabs as best I can because I'm involved to a certain extent with this type of, of business. Sure. And here, here's a little piece that you'll get a kick out of. Okay. Remember the brave little toaster? Yeah. John Lasseter made the Brave Little Toaster. What part did he make, Russ? Like, it was his brainchild. Like, he, he came up with the idea. He's the one who, like, fronted the whole thing. Hmm. Because at the time, John Lasseter worked for Disney. He was an animator at Disney. Hmm. And what was interesting was that John Lasseter pitched, and if you think about it, if you, if you think back to, like, all the characters of Brave Little Toaster, they're totally John Lasseter style. Think of the radio you know, or the vacuum cleaner or the blankie. The lamp. The lamp, absolutely. But what was really interesting was some of the, the details that Ed talked about was how when John Lasseter had pitched the idea to Disney to have it done, mm. Disney didn't like the idea. Of course they didn't. They fired him. He yes. gave a pitch for the Brave Little Dick. Toaster and they fired him for it. And then what ended up happening was that at that, at that point in time, Ed Catmull was working for Lucasfilm because George Lucas owned Pixar. Like some people don't under, don't really know this, this whole thing. Pixar was actually created at um, Lucasfilm and Industrial Light Magic. Like George Lucas had this, this expanding computer graphics division and that's where, that, where it got started and Ed was talking to John at one point because um, back when John was working for Disney, John got to have some sort of tour over, I think it was at the time it was at Lucasfilm. 
And he was blown away by their early demos and stuff like that. So the next time he talked to him, he was like, Hey, what are you doing? What are you up to? And stuff. And John was like, yeah, I got fired from Disney. <laughs> and so Ed said, Hey, you want, you want a job with us? Cause, because at the time they really needed someone like, like him to come in. He's like, absolutely. And he got a job at Lucasfilm. And what's crazy is like there, there there's a ton of like these crazy golden nugget morsels in here. So some people understand that George Lucas sold off Pixar. You know, he, he like he got, he just sold it off and it became its own entity. But some, but there are other people who don't really know why he did that, including myself. I didn't know. Sure. In this book, it talks about when George Lucas went through his divorce in 1983, he was financially strapped as a result of the divorce. So he had to unwind some of his like business sectors within like ILM and Lucasfilm, that sort of thing, even though he didn't want to, but I mean, he, he was really hurting. So he had to like tighten his, his, his belt basically. Right. Pixar was one of those companies. And what was crazy was that when you look at the, the, the system of events that transpired when they were looking to sell Pixar, do you, do you know who they sold it to? John Lasseter. No, John Lasseter was already an employee of Pixar. Apple? You're, you are very close. At the time, Steve Jobs had just been ousted from Apple. If you recall, the yeah. CEO yeah. got the board to like basically do a coup mm -hmm. and kick Steve Jobs out of his right. own company. So he was, Steve Jobs was out there looking for the next thing to do, saw the Pixar thing and bought it for $5 million. Ah, oh, what a deal. Which, by the way, Disney ended up buying and acquiring Pixar later on for $7.4 billion. Yeah, get them where it hurts. In 2006. Anyway, I'm having a blast with this book. Um, I don't know if I can have the camera pick up on this or not. I'm just kind of randomly going through this. But... Yeah, it um, does not pick it up anything. There, right? uh, well, there you go. See, I'm, I'm already highlighting. Oh, yeah. uh, it's, it's very difficult to do this upside down. But like you can see, like like there there's just all yeah, kinds yeah. of different things in here that uh, mm -hmm. I've found to be very very uh, important uh, and um, uh. also very influential. A lot of wise words to be had for sure. But I wanted to be able to share that with you and say if you're looking for a really good read, this thing, my goodness, uh, like I said, I'm not even done with the book yet. But there is a ton in here that it's just it's amazing because it focuses mostly on the success of Pixar from a managerial standpoint. And they talk about like how they were able to, able to cultivate this unique culture that was different than a lot of other studios. Um, and how a lot of that has to do with learning from your mistakes as a manager and also applying yourself in certain ways by being more hands off, trusting your people to do a good job, so on and so forth. So I was, man, that's great. I was having a lot of fun with it. That uh, and that kind of gives me a little bit of hope for the future. Not, not. I mean, not that John Laster was fired in the meeting, but you you can tell that you know some of these very talented people had. Thought, I mean, you could you could name other folks. I mean, Jobs, Lasseter. Um, oh, I was thinking of somebody who's that guy from Sega that was like, "Hey, you guys got Tom be Kalinsky. Tom Kalinsky. 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 Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That guy." I mean, they, they come to the big kahunas and go, hey, you trust me, I trust you. I work here. I have an idea, or there's something that you guys should be putting on your radar, and it's this. Um, so what do you think? And they go, you're fired. <laughs> and they go, what? Like, I thought I'm doing a good thing here. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm loyal. I'm talented. You hired me for a reason. I'm coming to you with this. Okay, okay. I'm out. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. And so then you go, well, I still believe in myself. And I, you know, right. And uh, then you go and you start a wonderful project and the world is changed basically because of your insight and your vision. Absolutely. And this art that you've made and you've, pa and we will pass on to our kids and their kids will pass it on to their, I mean, Man, what a standpoint in history. And then you sell it back to Disney. Oh, you want back in. You want me to... Go. Okay, well, you know yeah. what? It's billions now, okay? You want in? It's insane how, yeah, how the, those cycles work. And actually, you bring up something that, that we were talking about today during kind of a, a book review of sorts. 
at work. And one of the things that was brought up that I was actually, I, th I think I brought it up was that how, um, as creatives, we constantly are wrestling with this, this whole notion of giving creative pitches of things. Like we'll have ideas and we will present them to management who sometimes are not creatives, right? But the, we run a risk every time we, we pitch an idea because it could run, it could drop or it could, could be uh, coming across as flat or it causes uh, the management or leadership to question us as creatives just because they don't think the idea works. And so we have to develop a pretty tough skin as a result, which is a healthy thing. It's nice to have that. But at the same time, it is unfortunate in the sense where you really have to, advocate on your own behalf, be your best representative as you are pitching these ideas. And it's amazing when, when I read a book like um, creativity.inc because it's not all like sunshine and rainbows. It's not like, oh, I came up with this company and everybody loved me and sure. the end. Like <laughs> there was, there's a lot of details in that book that, that talk about how Ed was very stressed out at times, how, um, the idea of, of Lucasfilm selling off Pixar. They didn't want to leave Pixar. They had lots of different types of software that, that they were um, introducing that um, folks who were, who were in their niche of doing the business, like editors, for instance, old school editors would edit film literally with scissors and paste or glue. Like they would like where you want to make a cut in film, they would take the 35 millimeter film, they take a pair of scissors and go shink, and then they would find the part where they want to cut to, and then they would glue those parts together. And they didn't want to go to so like a software program that basically expedited and increased the pro productivity of that whole process. So they were they had to deal with that. I mean, it was it was crazy how even before Steve Jobs picked them up, how they kept having these deals fall through over and over and over again. Um, and then even when they, when they got the, the gig and working on, on their first film, which was Toy Story, how there were all kinds of challenges and setbacks and everything else. And, and so, I mean, I have mad respect for the man. Um, there are, are many other things that, that he invented and created that had made a profound impact on 3d modeling and animation. Uh, it, it, it was, man, it, it is amazing to, to read something like that. And you realize how this time period is full of these, these figures that we all like, like, you know, household names like Steve jobs, right. Or you have a bill Gates or you have, um, I mean, I mean who knows? Like even in, in, um, um, this day and age, like, like who are some people who are like household names that we, that you can think of? Uh, well, I was going to say like, um, John Madden, <laughs> the first name that came to John mind Madden. was John Madden, <laughs> but I, that's probably, that's dating myself. <laughs> um, but like, uh, who's the guy from the, uh, Tim, Tim Cook. Tim Cook is another one. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's crazy to look at because you realize all these, these people, even though they have their own companies and they, and they are, they have their own journey that they're going through they tend to kind of cross paths more often than right. not. Elon Musk, another one. Elon Musk is totally another one. Absolutely. He's a really good example, actually. Yeah, a really great example. And one of the things that I'm realizing is that if you just are phenomenal, that you will attract phenomenal. Right. And, I, and I think when, when you're at that level where they are all at, there is a natural curiosity to want to learn from each other, right? Like, like that's why you have people who would drop by and check out. I mean, I, I remember like this, not to digress too much, but like um, going back to Lucasfilm, um, there was a, if you recall, we did, we did a Joygasm episode back um, that was focused on THX and how the sound was created and how you had people who would stop by celebrities who would stop by who were in the music business because they were interested in, in checking out this brand new type of approach to making sound that was never made before. And if you recall the guy who created the THX synthesized sound, I mean, he had like Michael Jackson come over and hear it. I mean, it's just, just <laughs> insane. But I think that's where a bit of the light bulb turns on from someone like myself, because when you're, when you're that, when you're at that level of success and talent, 
I, I will grant you that, that there is a large percentage of that that comes from within. Like you have certain talents and abilities and gifts that perhaps may put you head and shoulders above other folks in the industry, right? But I, I think this other thing is a, is a big deal in that they never stop exploring. They never stop being curious. And whether it's other folks in their industry or maybe it's a cousin industry or maybe it's a completely different industry altogether, the, the commonality that I see is that all of these people who have been super successful at what they do and are super sharp and everything else, this is definitely one of the ingredients that makes them who they are. And I think that that is something that hopefully, I know I can speak for myself, that I hope that I can try and replicate on some level. But anyway, I could talk about that book for a long time. No, the name I was thinking of is um, Richard Branson. Totally. Richard Branson is another yeah. person who's very much like that. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so it was May the 4th. And the 4th. as as uh, so many people out in the world look forward to, you know, it is a fun time to be able to get back in touch with your inner Star Wars self. Right. One of the shows on Disney Plus that I watched, I'm curious if you saw it. Did you watch Star Wars Biomes? No. Okay. When you get a chance, you should check it out. It's really short. I think it's only like 20 minutes or something, mm. 25 minutes. Okay. They had the idea of having almost like a like a drone footage, like being really super high up. And it was just going over slowly these different types of recognizable um, surfaces on planets throughout the Star Wars universe. So like it starts off on this, this ice planet, right? Well, it's Hoth. And there are certain things that, that you'll see happening from a distance, like bird's eye view. Like you'll see like as the Imperial probe droid lands and you see the, poof, and then you see the floating Imperial probe droid come out and like start to drift away. And then you see like some tauntauns running across the, the snowy tundras. And, um, and then as it goes over the crest, you see like these Imperial walkers making their way to the, the rebel base, but it's so far away. It's like super high up. And you hear all the wind blowing and stuff. There's no music really. And, and it's just really cool. And so then it fades from that to like a deserty planet, right? Which could be like Tatooine. It could be a different planet altogether, like Jakku or something. But I just found it to be really unique because it was, it, it allowed us to kind of eavesdrop on these memorable moments from the different episodes. And even the, the TV shows, they, they had one of the planets from the Mandalorian. You see Mando's, ship come in. Remember, remember when he, when he came into that, that little village that had like the, the swampy crops right. and stuff and he had to help them out. You see like his ship come in and he, and he lands and it gets closer and you see the little to like tiki torches that are like lit and stuff. I don't know. I thought it was really fun to like have that kind of perspective. So just wanted to recommend it to you. Sweet. And I wanted to recommend it to all of you. Mm. Just check it out. It doesn't take long at all. It's it's just nice. I don't know. Well, speaking of drones, um, I checked to see if there was certain Star Warsy drones that go because they well the toys were all supposed to drop in price, right? But I don't think all the toys really dropped in price right? because there have been some drones that I've had my eye on, hmm. X-wing type drones, drones, Tie Fighter type drones, oh. and um, I like where you're headed with this. The, 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 they didn't drop in price, right? So. Probably too popular. Probably. But, but some of the, the toys drop like 75%, but I think those are like directly through Disney. Could be. Yeah. Speaking of toys, though, I was looking at the um, post that uh, you discorded me with with the uh, lightsaber, the actual retractable uh, lit up lightsaber. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And that was... <clears throat> Pretty darn cool, Russ, if I do say so myself. It was indeed. Yes, I was actually going to get to that. But but since you, you brought it up, Steve, I mean, I, I, I could just have it, us take a look-see right now. And uh, if you look at the screen, you'll notice this little lady. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's very impressive. It's literally a retractable lightsaber that they have somehow devised. That thing looks legit. It does look legit. I mean, you can still tell, like, it's, you know... Well, this could sound stupid about plastic, but I mean, um, well, you don't want it to be an actual well, laser. I, I, yeah, I know that. <laughs> oh, I'm saying, but um, 
So, but usually what they'll have like is one of those retractable click, 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 kind of, you know, expand out lightsabers. You have to right. kind of whip out and the whole thing goes crack all the way out. And then it'll make some magnetic noises. Exactly. Um, or it'll just already be extended and then you just flick a switch and then it, goes, and it lights up. But to have both come, come out. And light up, and you don't have to do anything. You just got to hold it. It's pretty legit. Oh, yeah, that's right. But they didn't, I mean, the, the, the thing says Galactic Star Cruiser, at, you know, at, at uh, Disney World. So they don't really say that they're coming out with it. But, I mean, you can pretty much predict. Well, no, th- this is where you can get it. Is It says, uh, well, here, I'll, I'll put it back on the screen. No, so I'll just put it back up yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. But it says, see it first when Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser opens at Walt Disney World Resort 2022. So next year, you will be able to not only check out the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser, but uh, you'll also be able to purchase that sweet, mm. sweet lightsaber. Ah, why'd you push me there? Right? Uh, push my knee. I like my knee digging into your yeah, thigh. I know you do. Uh, how much do you think it's going to be? Oh, man. It's going to be at least a few hundred bucks. $500. You know, I ended up getting, I can't remember what that was called. I want to say it was like a Force yeah. Effects lightsaber. You know, in fact, I feel bad because you just seeing as how handle. it's May the 4th, I, I could have had it here. You could have displayed it. <laughs> Actually, we'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe next year. Uh, right. We'll think about that. Indeed. Yeah, I'll make a little mental posty. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I did also wanted to draw your attention to Instagram because they had this fun little dealio at Sideshow Collectibles where they were giving away a life-sized uh, Grogu. I've heard of that. Mm-hmm. Very, very nice indeed. I don't really know if a winner has been announced mm-hmm. yet or not when it comes to that. But I'm the winner. I did. I, I, I entered. Well, well, we'll have to see if anything happens as a... It's not going to happen, Russ. As a result of that. You I'm, know, I'm a realist. It's not going to happen, Russ. IGN had a top-selling Star Wars games list. Did you see this? No. I'll start from number 10. So this has to do with uh, overall game sales. Number 10 is Star Wars Shadow of the Empire. I haven't played that one. Number nine is Star Wars Battlefront from 2004. I've seen the trailer plenty of times on that one. Lego Star Wars is number eight. I've seen that one. Number seven is Lego Star Wars 2, the original trilogy. I don't think I did that. Number six is Star Wars Battlefront 2 from 2005. Plenty of trailers for that one, yeah. Star Wars The Force Unleashed was number five. I haven't played that one. <laughs> <laughs> How have you not played any of these? Uh, I don't know. Anyway, number four, Lego Star Wars, The Complete Saga. I haven't played that one. Either. Number three, Star Wars Battlefront 2 from 2017. Did you play that? No. Oh, man. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order came in at number two. I've played that one. We have a winner. Absolutely. <laughs> But number one is Battlefront from 2015. Now, what Mm. I thought was interesting was that one of my all-time favorite Star Wars games and RPGs was not on the list. That's true. Do you remember what it was called? Knights of the Old Republic. I'm proud of you, Steve. I'll give you your Twinkie in a minute. Yeah, pay attention every now and then. (laughs) (laughs) But I thought it was kind of fun, and considering it was like May the 4th, and like saying, oh, yeah, well, what is it? Because Sure. When it comes to video game sales, they're not as transparent as one would think. I was thinking that Battlefront wasn't going to be that big, though, because, um, I mean, where's what, people like upset at Battlefront quite a bit. Okay, well, the game itself had merit to it. What people were upset about, if you recall, was the whole pay-to-win mm. issue that was going on that EA was guilty of, and they ended up pulling that out. Like, right. they, they, they made it right. Yeah. But the reputation was a little... Mm. Yeah. It's so. like... Somebody slapping you in the face and then telling them you're sorry. And like, yeah, thanks, but it still stings a little bit. <laughs> Why did you do that? Yeah. <laughs> That's not cool, man. I love to bruise. So the next thing that I also wanted to bring to your attention, Steve, is a new trailer that Marvel has released. About Star Wars? No. That'd be kind of <laughs> weird, wouldn't it? <laughs> be kind of cool, though, at the same time. Oh, they're like, oh, yeah, we'll give you kudos. Another the realm. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Welcome. 
<laughs> did you just hit the mic? Was that the sound? Did. Oh. I, I don't know what I hit it with, but I hit it with something. <laughs> Well, anyway, check out this trailer. It, it ends up kind of showing w- what movies are going to be in phase okay. four, but the lead up to it, I felt was very nice. I want to get your take on it. So take a look at the old screen here. And, mm-hmm. uh, well, let's take a look here. I love being with people. It's the most incredible thing in the world. What are you doing? Oh, this is nice. That world may change and evolve, but the one thing that will never change, we're all part of one big family. We are Groot. That man next to you, he's your brother. That woman over there, she's your sister. Higher, further, faster, baby. That's right. We're all part of one universe. Wakanda forever! That moves ever upward and onward to greater glory. I have seen that trailer so many times and I still get chills. I yeah. still I have goosebumps right now. Like Marvel totally knows how to make a trailer. They know how to make a movie. And it really is insane like what they're able to do with this stuff. But um, a trailer like that, it once again reaffirms they understand the concept of having an ecosystem of having different characters and movies and not only being content with staying with what they've already created, but they're expanding into these other comic book stories, these other worlds and whatnot. And it it just, it it, it hits you all in the right feels. What'd you think? Yeah, it does. I, um, I, I, I try not to watch like end game too much. Right. I mean, cause I don't want to, I don't want to get old. I really, you know, I sure. don't want to get tired of it. Yeah. So I don't watch those, those movies too much. Uh, I'll watch plenty of like you know, Iron Man, Captain America, you know, one, one, you know, like, you know, yeah. all those, but I don't want to watch like the main blockbuster, huge all together Avengers movies. I don't want them to get old. And so when I see scenes like that, like, you know, um, uh, Tony Stark and and Spider Man, like you know, like give him a hug, like okay, you're not turned to dust anymore. And Spider Man has no, you know, uh, that that's when the chills started. But um, yeah, I I ha- I have seen that one. Oh, you seen that that whole Russ. thing? 
I have. Um, and then, uh, you know, of course, watching Falcon and the Winter Soldier, uh, you know, him saying on your left all, all the time. And then that scene again with the portal opening and behind him and he's like on your left. Um, well, I loved how they used an actual theater right. experience. It wasn't like, oh, here's a scene from the movie. Yeah. You know, like someone was videotaping in the theater. Illegally. And, and yeah, How dare you. <laughs> <laughs> bootlegging, but can be used for good. You see the whole trailer I thought was an 11. It was phenomenal because it wasn't even a trailer for a particular movie. It was a trailer for its brand. It was for the right. Marvel brand. They were built. They were once again, building and reaffirming their brand affinity with all of the fans in the world. And I thought it was so cool how it starts off. You hear Stan Lee talking, right? And it was one of his famous right. speeches that he gave. And how they they correspond what he said with the different visuals that they picked out, which I thought was was just really nice. And then going into having these different really brief reminders of the sheer volume of of films that they've made so far. And then for them to like finish up by showing just film after film after film that's coming out this year and next year in 2023. It, once again, I mean, they are really planting that phase four flag into the sand and letting people know we are here to stay. There's a whole lot more. You get ready because you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. I'm, I know I'm kind of glad that they're that. Well, <laughs> it sounds kind of bad, but you know, COVID, from you, yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> COVID um, kind of made them change directions, but it was almost a, a direction for good because I mean, I don't, I didn't know maybe these movies were still planned for 2022, no, and they've all been pushed out because of COVID. That's what I thought. Remember, so, remember we were covering that about how like right. Black Widow, I think, was supposed to come out last year. Um, but in a way, it, it's it's good because it, it foc- made folks focus more on other stuff. More, It like gave on, them a break. On, 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 yeah, I, I'm not ready to go back quite yet. I mean, I am, but I'm not. Like, I'm still kind of superheroed out. Um, and so if, we, if, if they... I, I'm still living awful like in game. And that was like a while ago. I, and, but I don't need to jump back in right away. I'm still love it, living off of that high. And um, so I'm kind of glad in a way that it, it forced Disney to change directions, you know, maybe a little bit more star Wars, for example. Um, so, I mean, but now, yeah, I mean, I'm ready for black widow to come out and I'm ready for Wakanda forever to come out. I, you know, I'm, I'm ready for Thor love and thunder to come out. I agree with what, what you're saying. I think that in terms of, of how COVID ended up happening and causing them to delay their, their schedule. Basically it actually did them a favor because it allowed folks to be able to take a breather, a forced breather. And yeah, (laughs) well, and, and to this trailer's credit, like it's like we haven't had any films come out from, uh, from Marvel through 2020. We're now in, we're almost halfway through 2021 and so this drops at the perfect time to say, hey, we've got some fun stuff for you coming out here. And I think people's appetite has been once again sure. ready for, for more for more goodness. Yeah. So I, I, I'm glad that you had seen it already. I figured you had not, but well, uh, I'm impressed. Huh. I'm impressed, Steve. Jeez. Is it Cinco de Mayo? No, it's the topic of the day! Our topic of the day is the Star Wars Bad Batch of Disney cookies. Plus show. Yeah. What's that, Steve? Bad Batch of cookies. Bad Batch o cookies. I don't think we need to really go into a high level versus a, yes, just a deep level. Let's just dive right into it. If you haven't seen it, then we encourage you to check it out first. But if you don't care, then we're going to continue here. And uh, yeah, let's get to it. So two episodes have been released so far. Yeah. And to give a disclaimer, neither one of us, I, I, I believe... I know for me, this is the case. I've never watched any of the Star Wars Clone Wars seasons. Have you? No, I hear they're good, though. I do, too. And it, it's on my to-watch list. I'm guilty of, of not uh, seeing that. Guilty! Mm-hmm. Throw them in the brig. 
and <laughs> throw away the key. So it was interesting for me to be able to see a brand new show like this that clearly is in the same vein as the Star Wars, the Clone Wars, but at least there it's a different type of, of story within that world. What did you, what do you think of it so far? I like it, Russ. You know, I I wonder if they would use some of their other talent for the main movies. You know, because I, I think the Mandalorian and I think the Bad Batch. Then I think of like the last three movies they brought out and how they're so different. It's like Star Wars is becoming cool again, at least for <laughs> my side of the of the, the audience. You know what I'm saying, Rev? Uh, because I enjoy it. It's like, it's how it's supposed to be. And it's an animated movie, of course. And you might think, well, it's just for kids. But it ain't just for kids. It's not childish whatsoever. Uh-huh. But I, I am enjoying it. I I like it. I wish more of this was shared with, like, the rise of Skywalker and all this other stuff. Because I didn't feel that was really necessarily Star Wars whatsoever. I, I didn't care for those films at all. But I like this. I like it a lot. I'm surprised. I, I figured you would not care for it. So Why? It just didn't seem like your style. I mean, it, it, could it be better? Yeah. But, um... I didn't know what to think of it in the beginning. I mean, mm. I, I saw the trailer and it didn't look, the trailer didn't look bad. Um, but I like all the characters and they have strong personalities. I mean, there is some stuff I could, I could criticize and I, and I love criticizing Russ. I really do. I know you do. Um, for example, in the beginning, like the, the main Jedi dies. I'm like, no, you're not going to, five stormtroopers aren't going to kill the Jedi. That's just not going to happen. Well, okay, so you're a little, <laughs> you're a little cobwebby on the prequels there, Steve. If you recall in Star Wars Episode Three, The Revenge of the Sith. Yes. Senator Palpatine, a.k.a. the Emperor, goes yeah. around and says, uh, execute Order 66. Yes, I realize that, Russ. So this, well, if you realize it and you'd understand where they were doing, where they're doing, where that was coming from. How about that? I know where it's coming from, Russ. So, well, then why are you questioning why, how the Stormtroopers could take out the Jedi? The Jedi could have whipped their Stormtrooper booty, booties no problem. Not if they're surrounded. There was like four or five of them there. There were more than that, nah, Steve. I don't think more so, than Russ. That, they were surrounded. I have more faith in that Jedi than you do, Russ. The point is, is that they were referencing that moment in the okay. Star Wars episodes. So, like, at that point in time, it was... The, basically, they were le letting the viewer know, oh, this is the time period where all the stormtroopers turned... Fine. ...on all of the Jedi. Fine. Okay, fine. I'll give that to you. I still think it's messed up, though. <laughs> I still okay. think it's messed up. They wrote it wrong. Anyhow, mm. back to the good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing that would come to mind is that, you know, there, there's a group of dudes and they all have their, their strong points. Mm -hmm. And you can you almost start to think that, yeah, that's a stereotypical, like, smart guy and the stereotypical strong guy, but dumb guy, you know, uh, the sniper, whatever. But it's almost like they get almost to the stereotype without actually crossing the line to the stereotype. Like, like this, like Tech, for example, he's not overtly nerdy and like, oh, based on my calculations right. coming up here. You know, he, he's very intelligent, but he's not like annoyingly nerdy. Well, I think one of the successes of the show so far, and this is this is in line with what you're describing. Is it real? When I think of different cartoons from when we were kids back in the 80s and early 90s, mm. there was a certain formula that worked. Like if you think of like, like let, let's use Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Sure. The original cartoon that you and I watched, I felt was like the perfect type of blending between Raphael, Donatello, Michelangelo, and Leonardo. And Donatello was more of the inventor. He was more of the, the um, intelligent one, but he wasn't the nerdy one. He's, he could still hold his own. He had his bow. He was able to just uh, kick a lot of booty on his own terms, right? So there, were, there was that respect that was there. If you fast forward to where they are to, in today's versions of the, the Ninja Turtles cartoon, or even like when you think of, of the more recent Ninja Turtle films, I mean, they got Donatello wearing a, a 
pair of glasses with tape in the center here, kind of like where, where like it was popular or like kind of the, like the image for nerds back in the fifties or sixties or something. And it, and it just, it goes over what you're talking about. And so I agree. I think that when it comes to star Wars, the bad batch, I think that they were successful in that regard where like when I think of so many cartoons from back in our day, Ghostbusters, for example, too. Yeah. Ghostbusters is another great example, but I think when it comes to that, you were able to have these different characters that were very comfortable in their niche, right? They're like, they're their niche type role. Like you have like the sniper who's a, who's a little more mysterious and softer spoken. I love that stuff. I think it's great because it just plays right into that. And, and as long as it's just understood, yeah, yeah, th- this is like a, a, a squad or, or, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call, like every character has their own persona sure, and they, they're non apologetic about it. They're like, this is who they are. And it's funny too. Cause like the, the kind of the leader of the squad, he kind of has an eighties look like he he's does. got kind of the Rambo, Rambo hairstyle. Yeah. And he, I think he's, he's even got, got the, like the knife. Yeah. And, he's even got like the, I think he's like a red bandana or not a band, bandana, but a, a, a sweat band, or a sweat band headband a skull on it. Yeah. 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 I mean, like I totally got some Rambo vibes, uh, from him in particular, but yeah, I, th- I think in terms of where it's going so far, I think it, it's fun. It's it's a fun show to watch. Obviously, it's a it's designed to appeal more to the kids, like ten year olds and that sort of thing. I would say it's older than than maybe a ten year old. Maybe I maybe I'm completely wrong, but um, I it I would think if it was more centered with with kids. I mean, Omega it basically is like the child element of the movie mm-hmm. or the or the series, and maybe Caleb, but we only see Caleb for a little bit. Um, but the rest of the time, it's you're with this squad, um, and that's it. And they're, they're they don't act childish, and the the dialogue is not childish. I mean, yeah, it's it's not like crazy sophisticated dialogue, but um, anyhow, I I like how it's written, and um, I, the ship the, the ship that they have. It reminds me of the ship from Thunder Force. It's like a bigger ship yes. of Thunder Force. And Thunder I Force love is that a classic spaceship. game. Oh, gosh. What was it, Thunder Force 1, 2, and 3? I think they made a 4. They made a 4th one, yeah, for yeah. sure. But I love that little space. <laughs> Sega Genesis is like, I think that's you to draw it on binder paper. Anyway. That's great. So, um, anyhow, I, I think they're, they're, they're off to a great start. I was a little bit disappointed because the first show they gave us a treat. It was like 70 minutes long, I think it was. It was like a mini movie. At least it was it was an hour for sure, but I thought it was a little bit over an hour. I don't remember. And, but the, the next episode was... It may have been the pilot episode. Still, I that one was long, and this one was half the time, This the number two. Hmm. It's their own 30 minutes. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, Interesting. That's that, I guess. What do you think of the eye, uh, the eye style? The art style. So the art, I mean, I can take it. I can, I dig it. Um, I'm not crazy about it. I mean, there was some. It's kind of crude, isn't it? It is crude. It looks like it was, it's supposed to be on like Xbox 360, like one of those cinematics sort of thing. I almost think of it as, um, oh, what is it? What is it, Russ? What is it? Um, like dailies. Uh, it's kind of a term that we use. It's where you don't have uh, your your final polished render, but you use more of a crude version of it, Got almost it. like animatics. <laughs> To give the idea of what's going on, it's almost like that to me. The, I could see that. Um, there was there were times when there was close up on their faces, yeah, and their faces, like the, the texture and shading of their skin, almost looked like somebody carved it out of wood. It's intentionally like, rough. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It, like all of it, you're right. Like whether it's a metal texture or a skin texture or a wood texture, whatever it is. Yeah, like they intentionally just like kind of schlock it and slap it on there, which. You know, it, it, that is the style for the show, and that, that's different. It's, you know, it's, it's it works for for what yeah. it's doing. I do like if if I'm being totally honest, I do wish that there was a little more refinement, just because my personal taste has more to do with, with something that is a bit refined. And I feel as though like like this because they in, they intentionally went the direction of being a little more on, on like this kind of. Um, gesture, crude, sketchy uh, type of, of art style. It's almost like rigid in a way. Kind of, yeah. But I know that that, that was also the, probably the same art direction for Star Wars The Clone Wars, and that show is tremendously successful. There are all kinds of fans out there who, who right. love it. And I'm, again, I'm not like 
dogging no, it. No. It's just, it, you know, if I, if I had a choice, I would probably go for something maybe a little bit different. But having said that, I still think that the, the environment and the immersive quality of the show was notable. Did you I, think yeah, the no, same thing? I, uh, I, I do. I did. I agree. I was also going to say that uh, the chemistry, you can definitely feel the chemistry between the entire team. I mean, yeah, they, they kind of, uh, have like this tough love towards each other, but they like, they, oh, they, they belong together and they reference that a couple of times, but because they all think alike and they all know each other's thoughts in a way and they all know each other's abilities, they, they fit together, but they're not forced together. They know they should be together and we like them together. I like them. I do too. In yeah. the same scene, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that the, the chemistry is one of the strongest elements of the show so far. I definitely love how their sniper has been uh, basically messed with. Like, like they increase the amount of loyalty, so to speak, right. um, in his head. And so now there's this rift between him and his, his squad. And so it's, it's interesting. And I'm curious to see where this goes from here in terms of they have the girl with them. They're going to be going she's, on these different adventures. She's taking off that stone off her head for number. The medallion. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. But I appreciate also how they are living in this world that we have seen before in the films. Like, right. like you know, the... Oh, I was forget what the Kaminoans. I think that's what they're called. Um, but the, but they basically the, the aliens that created the clone troopers in the first place. Right. We were introduced to them for the first time in Star Wars Episode Two, And so it's cool that, like, oh, they've, they've brought in all these different um, places, which I'm glad like for, for a, a show like this, they could have very easily decided not to do that and go to like brand new planets or brand new locales. But I think that this was a wise move because it keeps it within this time frame of what's going on, which we haven't really talked about much either in the sense that this takes place right after episode three, where the, the galactic, the galactic empire has been formed. We see grand Moff Tarkin, uh, kind of doing his thing as well and, and positioning himself uh, for power. And what's his face dies? Uh, the bad guy. Uh, oh gosh, I want to say it's Rufus, but it's not, uh, it's not Rufus. <laughs> what? The, what what's his, they say in the beginning of the show, they're like, oh, uh, who, what's his face is going to take out General. Uh, oh, I want to say it's Ruf, Rufius, but it's not Rufius. <laughs> anyway, they, they say they take him out and the war is going to be over. And then that happens. And, but that, I, I remember that happening in like episode like three. Yeah. Or two. Oh, I'm, a little rusty I'm not sure who you're talking about. Sweet. <sighs> <laughs> Are you talking about general grievous? Grievous. Okay. I was That's like, a, I would say Rufus. I'm Rufus um, what sounds like Rufus? Something like that. He's grieving. <laughs> Yeah, he, uh, he's the old noodle. Uh, yeah, I haven't watched that one in a minute, Russ. It's Battle with names. Mm -hmm. Indeed. What's your name again? What's my name? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I, uh, I have no name. I'm nameless. Ooh. Let's just call him Toaster360. <sighs> I'm, I'm his caretaker. Yeah. How you doing? Hey, Jim, any thoughts uh, about the show other than that? Yeah, you know, I was well, something I was thinking about too. I'm going to start poking you in your room. I think, you know... Animated versus versus like real you know, film, like filming real folks and and, and graphics and stuff. Uh -huh. I am under the impression, and I don't. And I'm not a. I don't do this kind of stuff. So what do I know? But <laughs> I don't do this fancy mumbo jumbo. <laughs> what you call I, computer uh, graphics? Pull this rabbit out of a hat trick stuff. <laughs> Anyway, it involves <laughs> geometry, doesn't it? I hate geometry. Lots of triangles. <laughs> But I think, I mean, I, well, I would be, I would think this would be a reality. But if you were going to animate a movie mm -hmm. versus like hiring people to play the people that you're thinking of, uh, how they should look and the reactions that, that their faces should, should have or the sounds that you, the, that spaceships would make or their vehicles or the way the planet should look, I would think that would be easier and maybe better of sorts um, to have the entire thing animated characters, ships, creatures, whatnot, because then it's, I think it's a more accurate picture of what's going on in their mind. Because if you, if you, they put real people in with like fake made up 
you know, green screen creatures. And why not? The other people always have to look at some, you know, body in a, in a, in a green suit going like, yeah, I'm Yoda sort of thing. And it's not actually Yoda or it's not actually a, a creature or a monster or whatever. But when it, and the entire thing's animated, it is that way. They are reacting as if it's that way. They're not looking at somebody who's actually not there. You know, so in a way, I, I feel that something like this is almost better as an animated film. You're shaking the table. I like shaking stuff, Russ. <laughs> that it's better as being an animated feature film than uh, like a real life motion picture film. Every type of medium has its strengths for sure. And I think at the end of the day, it's great that we have these options. And even yeah. as time has marched on regarding special effects, you have constant improvements when it comes to like having synthetic or, or, or right. um, CG characters interacting with real actors. I think that there was this period of time where the um, acting community had to evolve a bit to that because they weren't used to... The, acting um, with non-existent locales or non-existent characters and that sort of thing. Yep. But I think that they've really, they've adapted really well. Maybe that's been pretty good. I mean, even when you think of like, like for instance, like Avengers, for example, I mean, there's an absolute sure. metric ton of uh, CG characters that they have in there and they do just fine. And I think at the end of the day, that's kind of the, the exciting or one of the exciting aspects about art in general is that, you can approach it using different types of mediums. I mean, that's why you have certain films that use stop motion, like Nightmare Before Christmas, right? Like that is a very unique approach to mm. how they want to tell their story on film versus something that's just live action, or maybe sure. you have some of the, the visual effects that are in there. And I think that's what makes us as viewers lucky is that we have different shows like Star Wars The Bad Batch, for example, that are decidedly an animated show. And that's fine. That's really cool. I mean, even if you think about animation, like you have 2D animated shows, you have 3D animated shows, you have stop motion. I mean, like my daughter watches um, Tumble Leaf on Amazon Prime and it's a really well done show, high production value, but it's all stop motion. So I think that that is, at the end of the day, a subjective opinion of fans who like, you know, if, if you prefer watching something that's totally animated, there you go. If you want to watch something that looks more realistic and maybe has some some special effects, yeah, yeah. You, got, you got that door over there. So You do have that door over there, too. Right? Do you think you're going to be watching the rest of the season? Yes. Ah, it warms Rusk. my heart. Come on. Hear you say that. You know, I start something, and by golly, I'm going to finish it. Well. Except if it's WandaVision, then I just have to finish it because we're going to talk about it. Oh, burn. <laughs> oh, man. man. On that note, that wraps up this episode of Joy Gas. Oh, Thanks for hanging boy. out with us. If you enjoyed this episode, we invite you to check out patreon.com slash joygasm. You get exclusive perks and early access to the show, not to mention it helps us continue doing what we'd love to do. Also, you can follow us on social media and YouTube. Just do a search for Joygasm TV. Last but not least, search Joygasm TV on Twitch to see us stream our gaming adventures live every Wednesday night when we're not getting borked by updates and everything else at 9.30 p.m. Central Time. Until then, we will see you all next week.